Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to another one of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute FLAD lectures for the fall of 2020. Uh, this lecture is uh, co-hosted by the Department of Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures, uh, led by Department Chair Professor Debbie Avila, a Portuguese-American, um, and uh, by the Portuguese Studies Program coordinated by Professor Inês Lima, who is here uh, to moderate this lecture. PBBI is thankful uh, for their partnership, both uh, in the uh, MCLL and the Portuguese uh, program, Portuguese studies, studies program. And we welcome uh, also everyone who is joining us, not just on the webinar here, those of you who, uh, I see we have students, we have faculty as well, uh, but also those who are following us uh, on Facebook. We are doing Facebook Live and um, uh, a, bit of, a little bit of news. And so that is if uh, you'd like to have a question posted, um, to Facebook Live, go ahead and do so. I have the most of the um, lecture will be moderated by Professor Inej Lima, so they'll tie me that I'll untie me to do in the Facebook Live questions. So please put them on there as uh, we uh, go throughout the lecture, and I'll uh, jot them down. Again, we are thankful for Flads for their sponsorship, for Flads' continued commitment to PBBI, and of course the Portuguese legacy in California. Our gratitude is always uh, to President uh, Rita Faden and her team. Uh, we also welcome all of those students who are following us here in the webinar, faculty from Fresno State, administration, community members, and guests from various parts of the state and the country, and those following us, as I said, on Facebook Live. Uh, a very special uh, shout out, if I may, on behalf of myself and Professor Inish Lima to our associate, interim associate dean for the College of Arts and Humanities, Professor Sergio Laporta, who is following us, who's one of the attendees. Thank you so much, Sergio, for being uh, here today. And we welcome those, as I said, on Facebook Live. And please, if you are on Facebook Live, um, do that. Uh, that is normal to do on social media, which is share, 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 share uh, with as many people as you can so we can get this out to as many people as possible. So now to our main event, we're honored to have such a distinct academic and a highly decorated scholar to bring us a fascinating talk, uh, a good friend from a, a university here in California, and to do, introduce our guest speaker, the coordinator of the Portuguese Studies uh, Program at California State University Fresno, Professor Inês Lima. Thank you, Dinis. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking you for including this lecture in the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute uh, lecture series and for sponsoring it and co-organizing it uh, with the Portuguese Studies Program uh, at Fresno State. I'm also extremely grateful to Dr. Jerome Duell for immediately accepting this invitation, which was made uh, more than a year ago. I remember that Dr. Duell was very excited to visit Fresno and to meet the Portuguese community at the time. And we hope that we can have you here again one day in person once uh, the circumstances allow it. Uh, finally, many thanks to those of you in the audience who are joining us tonight. Uh, I hope this is an enriching and enjoyable evening for you. And I would also like to invite you to and encourage you to ask questions or make comments during the Q&A session. Now I'd like to give a brief uh, presentation about our speaker's academic career and achievements. Uh, Dr. Jerome Duolf is professor at the University of California, Berkeley in the Department of German and Dutch Studies. He's also the director of UC Berkeley's Institute of European Studies and chair of the Chancellor's Advisory Board on Study Abroad. He currently also serves as interim director of UC Berkeley Global International and Area Studies Research Cluster and of the UC Berkeley Center for Portuguese Studies. Duwolf graduated with a major in Germanic philology and a minor in Portuguese studies at the University of Ghent in Belgium. He holds a master's degree from the University of Porto in Portugal and a doctoral degree in German literature from the University of Bern in Switzerland. Before coming to Berkeley, he taught at the University of Porto and the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. His research interests mainly focus on Dutch and Portuguese colonial and post-colonial literature and history, as well as the transatlantic slave trade. In 2010, he was distinguished by the Hellman Family Faculty Fund as one of the best of Berkeley researchers. And in 2012, he won the Robert O. Collins Award in African Studies, as well as the American Culture's Innovation in Teaching Award. 
In 2014, he was distinguished with the Hendricks Award of the New Netherland Institute for his research on the early Dutch history of New York and the first slave community in Manhattan, among other awards. Today's lecture is titled, Did the First Enslaved Africans in Manhattan Speak Portuguese? Iberian Linguistic Elements Among the Black Population in New Netherland Between 1614 and 1664. The lecture will shed light on the relationship between the transatlantic slave trade and linguistic makeup of the United States of America at the onset of its formation, focusing on the Portuguese language. It will specially contribute to depicting the role of, the ens of, the ensla of enslaved Africans in this rich linguistic composition and to further research about the impact of colonialism in the enslaved Africans' languages by analyzing the crossing between colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade from the point of view of language. Thank you, Dr. DeWolf. Thank you so much, uh, Denise, and thank you so much, uh, Ines, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, for me to present my research here at uh, Fresno State University. It's a big honor and I'm thrilled to uh, share with you some of my research findings. In order to do so, uh, I will share the screen and uh, so you can see the PowerPoint presentation I prepared for this lecture and I hope you can all um, see this. Um, Ines, can you confirm briefly? Is that yes. okay? Can you see yes, everything nicely? Very good, okay. wonderful. Um, so let me start perhaps by just saying a few words about myself. Uh, Ineos gave, gave a, a wonderful introduction, uh, but I, I would like to say a few words about myself in order to explain how come then I decided to focus on this research um, topic. Uh, as Ineos mentioned, I'm originally from Belgium. Uh, I graduated from the University of Ghent uh, in Belgium um, with um, a focus on Germanic philology. But I was also very interested in, in Romance languages, um, uh, French, of course, but also Spanish and, and Portuguese. And, and that took me, and uh, then uh, thanks to the Erasmus uh, project, it took me uh, to Porto. Uh, it took me to Porto. Uh, I lived in Porto for a year, uh, fell in love with the Portuguese language, the Portuguese culture, the Portuguese people, uh, the city of Porto, I have to stress that as well. Um, and um, later I had an opportunity to start teaching uh, in Porto. Um, I taught in Porto at the Faculdade de Letras uh, for about uh, eight years. And during that time, I was also a visiting professor several times at the University of Sao Paulo uh, in uh, Brazil. And then in 2007, I uh, came uh, to Berkeley and started to teach uh, in Berkeley and uh, became a professor at the Department of German and Dutch Studies. So once again, with a focus on, on Germanic philology and literature, and, and uh, in a way, uh, kind of this Portuguese angle uh, in, in my research disappeared a little bit, which, which I regretted. Uh, but the wonderful thing is that at one point it came back. And Portugal came back into my research uh, due to a special course that we have in Berkeley. It's called the American Culture course. It's a legacy from the 1960s. And the idea was that we would teach American culture, American history in a different way, not a traditional way that, that tended to be, you know, kind of a Eurocentric perspective on American history, but in a way that you would pay attention in your course to at least three different ethnic groups. And that um, triggered in me an interest in, in looking at the early history of New York. I knew, of course, that New York had had a Dutch colonial history. The city was founded uh, by the Dutch in the 17th century. And of course, there was a lot of interaction at the time with the Native American population. Um, but there was also, and I knew that, there was uh, an enslaved black population in New York. Um, and that started as a course, and then I became increasingly interested in learning more about the black population in the 17th century Dutch colony in Manhattan, and, and, um, and that kind of triggered then this, this research and development. Um, so as I said, we will be looking um, in today's lecture at the very early history of Manhattan. Uh, what you see here is a 17th century uh, drawing of Manhattan. You see in the background uh, the Dutch uh, colony. 
Uh, it's something that is still very present in a way um, in Manhattan. Uh, it's not by accident that uh, the official flag of New York City uh, is a flag that has the, the original 17th century Dutch colors. It's also not by accident that you see in the middle of this flag uh, a Dutch person standing. Uh, you see a Native American, of course. You see the year 1625, which was the year in which the Dutch bought Manhattan from the Native Americans. It's a very interesting history. So they actually um, made kind of a business transaction, a business deal with the Native Americans to buy the island. Uh, and what you also see in the very middle, I'm not so sure if you see it well, but you see here a little animal. And this little animal is the very reason why the Dutch had a colony in Manhattan. It's a beaver. Um, the Dutch were very interested in beaver pelts. And the reason was that they used those pelts for luxury textiles, especially luxury hats. And you can see that in 17th century Dutch paintings. Here is an example of such a luxury hat made with beaver pelts uh, from North America. Um, but um, as I mentioned to you, um, my focus in this lecture will be on the enslaved and free also uh, black population um, in the Dutch colony in Manhattan in the 17th century. Uh, we estimate that about 10% uh, of the population uh, was black. Um, and what is fascinating for us is to know that they virtually all had Portuguese names. Yeah? They were called João, Luís, Fernando, um, and that's quite intriguing. And, and it raises a number of, of questions. Uh, the main question, of course, is if they all had Portuguese names, and how far were they also influenced by Portuguese culture? Um, and due to time constraint, in this presentation, I will focus on one aspect of, of possible Portuguese influence, which is the aspect of language. Yeah? And they had Portuguese names, but did they also speak uh, the Portuguese language? It's an important question, um, because if the answer is yes, then this would mean that the very first Portuguese speaking community in North America actually was African. Yeah? And that's a very, I think, a very important uh, observation uh, to me. Now, um, the question, did they speak Portuguese? Um, on the one hand, um, this would be surprising. Uh, it would be surprising because there are several studies, of course, on, on the influence of, of Portuguese on Creole languages that developed in the Americas, um, spoken by black communities. Uh, but those studies traditionally focused exclusively on Latin America and the Caribbean. Yeah, here you see a few examples of such studies. Uh, these studies indicate, in fact, that many Creole languages in the Americas uh, were strongly influenced by Portuguese. But again, the focus traditionally was on Latin America and on the Caribbean. And there was no research for Portuguese linguistic uh, influences among black communities in North uh, America. And that makes this study um, quite special and in a way pioneering. Um, on the other hand, uh, it wouldn't be totally surprising um, to find traces of the Portuguese language among the black population in uh, Manhattan. Um, and the reason why it would not be surprising is that at the time when the Dutch uh, had uh, a colony in Manhattan, the Dutch also had a colony in Brazil. Um, we're speaking about uh, the 17th century, and we're speaking about a time uh, in history that uh, Dutch forces uh, occupied um, the territory marked here on the poor point as, as uh, purple, um, and Dutch Brazil. Yeah. Um, Dutch Brazil, uh, a colony that did not last for a very long time, uh, but it did make an impact. Um, still today, uh, in Brazil, you find, <coughs> excuse me, you find some traces of this Dutch um, historical presence. Excuse me, you find this, for instance, most clearly, I would say, in the city of Recife. Uh, if you see this image of Recife, it does in a way, if you think about it, it does remind one a little bit of Amsterdam, right? It's very flat and there is, there is these bridges everywhere. There's a type of canal and that's not by accident, right? It was, it was in a way designed and expanded uh, by, by Dutch uh, architects. 
um, the Dutch legacy um, in that part of Brazil also lives on in descendants uh, of, of Dutch people. Um, some names remained in the region. Uh, perhaps the most famous person with such a name is, is Chico Buarque de Holanda, yeah, a, a descendant of, of these uh, 17th century Dutch uh, settlers. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly, you find how this legacy continued in, in importance uh, for Brazil in terms of art and culture. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the very first paintings of Native Americans from Brazil were made in Dutch Brazil by Dutch painters, such as uh, Albert uh, Eekhout. But all of this to say something simple, namely that, that um, during the time that the Dutch had a colony in Manhattan, they also had a colony in Brazil. And this is important for my um, story. Um, we also know that in other former Dutch colonies, um, Creole languages developed with a considerable Portuguese linguistic influence. Uh, and here I could mention, for instance, the case of, of Suriname. Um, Suriname, <clears throat> a neighboring country, a small neighboring country um, of Brazil. Um, many of the Dutch settlers who had lived in Brazil moved to Suriname when the Portuguese reconquered uh, Brazil. Um, and um, the Dutch then established sugarcane plantations uh, in Suriname. Uh, many enslaved Africans worked on those plantations and some were able to escape. And they escaped into the jungle and they established in the Surinamese jungle uh, so-called maroon communities, so communities uh, of runaway slaves. Um, and in those communities, languages, Creole languages developed. And the example you see here is the one from Saramaca. Uh, it's a maroon community that still exists today uh, in Suriname. And if you go to Saramaca, the language people speak is a language with a strong Portuguese uh, influence. Yeah, they use Portuguese words such as camisa, mulher, homem, uh, faca, a key, yeah? uh, a lot of uh, both Portuguese uh, vocabulary. Um, Portuguese linguistic influence is even stronger in another Dutch colony, a uh, former Dutch colony in, in the Americas, and namely in the Caribbean, uh, where there is uh, three islands, the islands of Aruba, uh, Curaçao, and Bonaire. Uh, and on those three islands, um, a Creole language developed among the black population that is called Papiamento. And if you look at this list of words in Papiamento, uh, you will easily find traces of the Portuguese language. Yeah? People in Curaçao uh, to say good morning, for instance, they say bom dia, yeah? just like people do uh, in, 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 in Portugal. Um, so if we have this influence in, in Suriname, if we have this influence in, in Curaçao, why not also in Manhattan, right? It's, it seems almost logical, uh, but it is not, it is not. And, and what makes the story complicated is that the traditional explanation for Portuguese linguistic influences in the case of Suriname and, and Curaçao is the presence of Sephardic Jews. Um, so let me explain that to you. Um, the Dutch occupied part of Brazil um, and a large percentage of the population that lived in the Dutch colony in Brazil was Jewish. Uh, we estimate that about 30%, perhaps even more of the population uh, was Jewish. Who were these people? And these were people who had lived previously on the Iberian Peninsula, in Spain and, and mainly in Portugal actually. Um, they were expelled because they were Jewish, um, and many of them then moved to Amsterdam. So you had a huge Portuguese community, uh, Jewish Portuguese community in Amsterdam in the 17th century. Uh, there's still relics of this uh, today. If ever you visit Amsterdam today, you are able to visit uh, the Portuguese synagogue uh, that still exists uh, in Amsterdam dating back to 1671. And it's called Portuguese because so many of the Jews originated uh, from Portugal. Um, and uh, many of these, uh, since they spoke Portuguese, were very enthusiastic about this Dutch colony in Brazil and moved then from Amsterdam to Recife and, and to this Dutch colony 
uh, in uh, Brazil. And this explains why the oldest synagogue in the Americas uh, is, it was built um, in uh, Recife and um, still exists. Um, it doesn't serve as a synagogue anymore, it's a museum today, but, but the building is still there. Uh, the oldest uh, synagogue in the Americas uh, built um, during the Dutch occupation of Brazil uh, in uh, Recife. Uh, but uh, as you all know, uh, the Portuguese at one point reconquered um, um, the territory in Brazil that was lost to the Dutch. The Dutch were expelled and hence also the Jewish community was expelled. Many of them moved back uh, to Amsterdam, but others did not. Others moved on for instance, to Suriname. Uh, this is why the second oldest uh, synagogue in the Americas was built uh, in Suriname. Uh, today, it is on the ruins of that synagogue uh, that remained. Uh, but still today, uh, Suriname has a small but thriving uh, Jewish community with roots in, in the 17th century. Um, and still today, in, in the capital of Suriname, Paramaribo, uh, there, is, there is a large uh, synagogue. It's actually interesting, just a small detail, to see that uh, Suriname is probably the only example of a country where um, the mosque and the synagogue are side by side. Um, and they insist that whenever they have a major holiday, they visit each other and celebrate together. It's actually a wonderful example of, of religious, um, you know, more than tolerance. It's actually living together and also celebrating uh, together uh, their uh, traditions. Uh, others went to Curacao. And this is why the oldest still existing synagogue in the Americas uh, can be found on the island of Curissa. And when you enter um, this synagogue, uh, you will see that uh, the soil consists of sand. And the reason that it is sand has to do with the history of these people. They made the soil out of sand because they wanted to make a connection to their ancestors who still lived in Portugal at a time when Judaism was prohibited in Portugal and when any type of, of Jewish religious activity had to be done in secret. Yeah? And, and that's why they had a soil on sand because then the neighbors would not hear um, that they were there. Um, so this legacy kind of also still lives on uh, in, in Curacao. Now this is a very long story to say something simple, namely uh, the traditional explanation of Portuguese words in Creole languages in Suriname and, and, in, and in Curacao is that this influence can be explained with reference to the Sephardic Jews. Yeah? So the, the idea is there were lots of Sephardic Jews there, they came originally from Portugal, they spoke Portuguese among each other, they were deeply involved in the transatlantic slave trade, they had lots of slaves themselves. So the idea is that this is where the Portuguese linguistic influence on the Creole languages that then were spoken by uh, enslaved blacks, that this is where the influence comes from. And this is problematic for us. And why is it problematic? It is problematic because in Manhattan, there was hardly any Jewish presence. And there were very few um, Jews living in the Dutch colony in Manhattan, and the few that lived there arrived very late. So that raises the question, if we find traces of the Portuguese language among enslaved blacks in Manhattan, where does the Portuguese influence come from? So let me try to explain this then by telling you a little bit more about what we know about the origin of the enslaved black population um, in uh, Manhattan. So let us go back to the, uh, to the drawing. Uh, Manhattan, 17th century, about 10% of the population black. And the earliest reference to an enslaved person in Manhattan uh, dates to 1628. It's a letter from um, the Dutch reformed minister uh, informing that um, he was dissatisfied with his, and I quote, um, Angolan slave women. Um, so he had uh, uh, female slaves and uh, they originated from Angola. How did they end up in Manhattan? Um, the most likely, we don't know, uh, but the most likely explanation is that they were captured. They were captured on their way from Angola to Brazil. And they were captured by ships from the Dutch West India Company. The Dutch West India Company was a trading company founded in 1624 
Um, it's the company that would um, then um, govern and rule New Netherland, so the Dutch colony in, in Manhattan. And at the same time, um, this company had several ships cruising the Atlantic and hunting Iberian ships. Um, and when they would capture an Iberian ship, they would steal everything that was on those ships. And if it was gold and silver, that was easy. They could just take it back home to the Netherlands. But occasionally, they also captured ships. And in those ships, there was no gold or silver, where there were uh, human beings being transported. Um, those uh, human beings were uh, almost always uh, people who had been shipped from uh, Luanda, um, from uh, the island uh, of Luanda in front of, of, of mainland. Africa. Um, these ships uh, were on their way uh, to Brazil and the Dutch would capture the ship um, and then uh, confiscate uh, the enslaved. And they could not take them to, to, to the Netherlands uh, because in the Netherlands it was prohibited to sail human beings on the market. You could not do that. Uh, but it was not a problem for the Dutch authorities to let them sell the enslaved somewhere else. So the Dutch had kind of double standards. At home, slavery was not possible, but in the colonies, this was not perceived as a problem. And most of these enslaved were taken to the Dutch colony in Brazil, but some uh, also ended up in Manhattan. And those were then the first uh, enslaved to um, arrive uh, in Manhattan and live in Manhattan. The Dutch in Brazil, however, um, wanted more than just the occasional capture of a ship transporting enslaved people from Angola to Brazil. And this uh, led to the decision by the Dutch in 1640 um, to attack uh, Luanda and conquer Luanda from the Portuguese. Yeah? And then for several years, Luanda will, will be in, in Dutch hands. Um, and the Dutch will essentially take over the slave trading infrastructure uh, from the Portuguese, and they will start sending from Luanda um, enslaved people to their colony in uh, Brazil, which caused panic in the rest of Brazil, because in the rest of Brazil, uh, the economy thrived on, 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 on slavery, on slaves, and if those people were not, not coming anymore, the rest of Brazil would just, um, you know, not function uh, anymore. So this explains why uh, Portugal then started a campaign to expel the Dutch from Brazil. Uh, it's a campaign uh, that started in the late uh, 1640s um, and it became successful first in the city of Saint Louis, uh, the first city to be liberated, so to speak, from the Dutch. And then from there, Fortaleza, Natal, Paraíba, Olinda, and, and ultimately, and by uh, 1650, all the Dutch half um, in uh, Brazil is the city of Recife. Yeah, they lost pretty much everything. All that, that they have left is the city of uh, Recife for now. Um, and that explains why many Dutch people start to leave Brazil. Yeah, they see that Brazil is a lost cause and uh, staying there is, is dangerous. It doesn't make sense anymore. And some move from Brazil to Manhattan. Uh, among them is a captain, Captain Johan de Vries, who arrives in Manhattan from Brazil with, um, the sources say, his swartenne, is a Dutch word meaning a black lady. Uh, so he, he brought a black lady from Brazil, most likely his concubine. Um, she was not an enslaved person. Uh, and he also brought two enslaved people um, with him. Uh, Ilaria Criole and Paulo d'Angola. Um, uh, and that's an indication that, that now we see kind of a second source of people, enslaved people arriving uh, in Manhattan, namely people uh, who had been living uh, in Dutch Brazil and then were taken by people who left Dutch Brazil and ended up in Manhattan and who brought with them some uh, enslaved. Still, uh, we're speaking here about small numbers, a few dozens, uh, dozens of people, not more, uh, but more <clears throat> were to come. More were to come uh, because the situation in Recife becomes gradually unsustainable for the Dutch. 
And it becomes unsustainable at a time when the Dutch still occupy Luanda. And in Luanda, uh, enslaved people keep arriving from the interior of Africa. And that causes a problem to the Dutch administration in Luanda. What to do with these people? Because these people need to be fed. And um, these people are potentially a risk. Uh, there's a risk that they run away or, or that they will rebel. So the Dutch in Luanda want to send as quickly as possible these enslaved Africans to Recife, which they do. But upon arrival, um, the Dutch authorities in Recife don't know what to do anymore with these enslaved people. Um, because all the territory that they had previously occupied was lost. So what do the Dutch um, do? Um, they sent them somewhere else. And we're speaking here about a, about a thousand people uh, from Africa arrive in Recife, the Dutch in Recife don't know what to do with them, so they send them somewhere else. And where do they send them? They send them to a nearby island, an island that today uh, belongs to Brazil, and at that time was occupied by the Dutch. It's the island of Fernando de Noronha. And they send them to Fernando de Noronha, um, but find out that this is not a solution uh, because there's not enough food on Fernando de Noronha to feed and that many new people. The consequence is that the Dutch then decide to do something they hadn't experienced with in the past, but now they decide to do that. They essentially decide to take those enslaved people to the Caribbean and they try to sell them to whoever wants to buy them. And the English, the French, uh, doesn't matter anymore as long as they get rid and get at least some money for these people the Dutch are willing to sell to whom wants to pay. And most of them are sold in Barbados. Um, but since some had attracted diseases, um, not all of them could be sold in Barbados. And the ones that survive uh, are taken to the Dutch colony in uh, Manhattan. And so here we find a, a third source of, of origin, people who um, were shipped from Luanda, arrived in Brazil, from Brazil were taken to Fernando de Noronha, from Fernando de Noronha they were taken to the Caribbean, and then from the Caribbean they ended up in Manhattan. Um, we estimate that this shipment probably almost doubled the slave population, so by now we're like in 1650, 1655, we estimate that about 100, 150 enslaved people lived in Manhattan. What happens next? 1654, uh, Recife falls. Uh, the Dutch colony in Brazil uh, comes to an end. And on top of that, um, the Dutch also lose Luanda. Uh, Luanda is also reconquered um, by the Portuguese. Um, a, a military campaign organized actually from Brazil. Uh, ships are sent from Brazil to Luanda uh, to liberate uh, Luanda or, or to expel the Portuguese, the Dutch from Luanda, uh, led by Salvador Correa. Um, a campaign that is successful, the Dutch are kicked out of, of Brazil, are kicked out of Luanda, and this is all very problematic for the Dutch West India Company that is now virtually bankrupt. Yeah. The Dutch West India Company had invested a lot of money in Brazil, and now they lose, they lost everything. What do they do to avoid bankruptcy? Um, they look at the territories that remain under their control, um, which is a few islands in the Caribbean, it's Manhattan, and some territories in Africa, some fortresses in Africa that the, port that the Dutch had um, taken away from the Portuguese. Um, um, Luanda, as I mentioned before, was at this point no longer Dutch, it was re reconquered uh, by the Portuguese but some other fortresses remained uh, under Dutch control, the most famous of which was uh, Fortress Elmina uh, in Ghana. And the Dutch uh, from Elmina um, decide then to essentially do what they had done before with those enslaved that they sent to Fernando de Noronha. Essentially what they decide to do is they decide to ship enslaved Africans from Elmina and other fortresses in West Africa to uh, their colony in the Caribbean, uh, the island of, of Curaçao. Uh, and then from Curaçao, they decide to sell them to wh whoever wants to buy them. Uh, French, even the Spanish can come to Curaçao and, and buy enslaved people. The Dutch uh, don't care anymore about their former enemies. They sell to anyone 
who wants um, to buy enslaved people in order to not to go bankrupt. Um, um, the problem with this is that Curacao is not only a small island, but also a very dry island. It's very difficult to produce food uh, in Curacao. Um, and this is where Manhattan comes into play. Manhattan comes into play in the person of Peter Stuyvesant, or Peter Stuyvesant, uh, the Dutch governor of Manhattan, uh, who makes the following suggestion. Uh, in Manhattan, we can produce a lot of food and we could ship that to Curacao. And in Curacao, you could pay us with enslaved people. And then we take those enslaved people and we transform Manhattan into kind of a regional safe trading anthropos. And then from Manhattan, we will sell all over North America enslaved people. That's kind of his, his vision. Um, um, we see that, that uh, the Dutch authorities in Curacao um, um, follow this reasoning. They start sending uh, small shipments of enslaved people from Curacao to Manhattan. And Stuyvesant uh, successfully manages uh, to sell them. And this explains why in July 1664, um, a ship arrives in Manhattan from Curacao with no less than 300 enslaved people, 300, which uh, immediately doubles the entire slave population in the Dutch colony. Stuyvesant uh, prepares to sell these people, but then all of a sudden an English fleet arrives and uh, demands the Dutch to surrender Manhattan. Stuyvesant realizes that he does not have enough manpower uh, and military power to beat uh, the English. Stuyvesant uh, surrenders. It is the end of the Dutch colony in Manhattan in 1664. The English take over and the English then rename um, the colony uh, New York. Yeah. So that's kind of the brief history. Let us now turn to um, the origin of the enslaved black people in Manhattan in the 17th century in the Dutch colony. And here names help. Uh, we have seen before that the first names uh, were almost exclusively um, Iberian uh, names. And in some cases, we also find enslaved people with a last name. Um, and um, curiously enough, quite often this last name um, is also an Iberian name. And here are some examples, names like Brito, Primeiro, uh, Albuquerque, um, you, you find uh, among these people. Um, and sometimes you also find an indication of origin of where the people came from. And uh, some enslaved blacks will have a second name that kind of highlights where they originated from, um, such as uh, the following. I made a list uh, for you. Here you can see kind of an overview of names with an indication of, of origin. Uh, and as you can see, it's very diverse. It can be San Tome, it can be Cabo Verde, um, even Portugal. Yeah, we see the case of an Anthony Ferdinand who came from Cascais. Uh, I have no idea how he ended up in, in Manhattan. Um, but what you can also see is that the vast majority originated from Angola. Yeah? Um, where did these people uh, from Angola then actually came from? Yeah? Because Angola in, in the 17th century is something different than Angola uh, today. So let me show you a map uh, from the 17th century, at least a map that helps us locate um, these people um, in the 17th century. We have um, Dutch sources um, from uh, Luanda um, that specify where the enslaved actually came from. And they highlight four groups of people who are shipped uh, from Luanda to um, um, the Dutch um, colonies. For starters, we have people from what the Dutch call Luangu. Luangu is here, so to the north of the Congo Kingdom. Um, the second group that is mentioned are people from the Congo Kingdom themselves. And the third group is what the Dutch call Mbundus or Mbundus. And those are people from um, the area southwest of the Congo Kingdom. So what is today uh, Luanda uh, and the provinces of Bengo and Kwanzaa uh, in Angola. And then and the last group is what the Dutch called uh, Shingas, 
And this is territory that was ruled by the African queen Nzinga. Um, she was queen of Matamba. Um, and here we are speaking about the territory southeast of the Congo uh, kingdom, uh, what would be today the provinces of Malange and Ouija um, in, in Angola. Yeah. So this is where kind of uh, most of the enslaved came from who were then shipped from Luanda uh, to uh, the America. What language did these people speak? Yeah. Um, we don't know. Uh, we don't know for sure. All we know is that for a long time it was not Dutch. Yeah. So you had a, 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 a relatively large black population in Manhattan. It was a Dutch colony, but we know that for a long time Dutch was not the language they would use among each other. Uh, and we know that, for instance, through court cases. Uh, we find people um, who arrived in the colony from Africa 10, 15 or more years ago, um, and then they have to go to court. Um, and uh, they say, uh, we can't uh, understand what is said in the court. We can't defend ourselves because everything is in Dutch. Yeah? And so they clearly were not fluent enough in Dutch which is an indication that most likely they used among themselves a different language. Yeah. Um, but what language uh, was that? Um, as we saw before, the dominant group originated from Central Africa, from this region here uh, in, in, in Africa. The two um, main languages spoken in this part of Africa, the African languages, are in the northern part, uh, Kikongo, uh, in the southern part, uh, Kimbundu. Yeah? So those are the two main African languages um, that are spoken uh, in, in the area. And we assume um, that in Manhattan, both Kikongo and Kimbundu uh, were spoken, uh, perhaps even a mixture of both, since those languages are not very different uh, from each other. Um, but was it also the lingua franca? Was it also the language that all the enslaved would use among each other? Um, and here I have doubts. I have doubts because what we see in Manhattan is we see relationships between people from very different parts of Africa. You know, we see, for instance, uh, a marriage taking place between Susanna Congo and Peter uh, from Saint Tomé. Yeah. Uh, we see a marriage, uh, Anna from Angola, with Francisco van Cabo Verde. Yeah, and um, so that raises the question then, what language would someone from the Cape Verde Islands who was married with someone from Angola, what language would they speak? How would they communicate with um, each other? Um, there are indications that this language may have been Portuguese. Um, probably a Portuguese pidgin, a Portuguese Creole, but a language uh, based on, on, on Portuguese. And why do I say that? Uh, because there's a couple of sources um, in Dutch documents that mention language. Um, and let me mention, um, start uh, by mentioning to you a case from 1655. Um, it's a case of a Dutch man called Tonys who bought an enslaved black lady. Um, the lady upon arrival falls. She lifts herself up again and then says the following. Here you see uh, the quote. Uh, you can see. Um, it essentially mentions that Tony's cry um, conducted the Negress as she fell on the ground. And then to give herself kind of force to stand up again, she cries, Arriba. And then she stands up, but then she falls again. And then somebody comes and asks her, What's wrong with you? Uh, and she answers, Morgen, morgen. Um, and then uh, the person says, oh, she's probably drunk. And then the poor lady dies. Yeah, it's actually a very uh, sad um, um, passage that we find here in Dutch documents, but fascinating for us because it's one of the very few where we hear actually enslaved uh, people speaking. Right? Um, now, if you look at those two terms, uh, morgen morgen uh, clearly does not mean I'm drunk. Yeah? It's, it's most likely uh, the lady was saying in Portuguese, you know, I'm dying. Uh, arriba, with the meaning of up, yeah, um, most likely also relates to Spanish Portuguese. Um, today in Portuguese, uh, this expression is rarely used. Uh, it's more Spanish. Uh, but in 17th century Portuguese, um, it, was, it was very common. Uh, you still find that in, in certain expressions, such as ribatejo, 
for instance, yeah, the term riba for up um, was, was very common. You still find it today uh, in, in Cape Verdean Creole, for instance, as well. Um, another indication and that the language they may have spoken among each other um, may have been a Portuguese pidgin is another court case. A court case from 1662 um, about an enslaved black man called Mateo. And Mateo was arrested for drinking alcohol on a Sunday. And the Dutch were very strict about that. Uh, you could sell slaves, but you could not drink alcohol on a Sunday. Yeah? Um, and uh, Matteo denies uh, his case is taken to court. Uh, the judge calls witnesses. And then one witness says, yes, uh, I saw Rizzo Veert Waldron, who's a, who's a Dutch settler. Um, and he was with the Negro, Matteo. Um, and they were speaking. Uh, and, and then the judge wants to know, did you understand what they were saying? And then the witness says no, because they spoke Portuguese to each other. Um, and we know that this Dutch person, this Resolveer Valdron, had lived in Brazil before coming to Manhattan. And so it's very likely that he knew Portuguese. But what we see here is evidence that, that he was actually speaking with a black person and he was speaking in uh, Portuguese. We also know that this very same Dutch settler, uh, Mr. Waldron, um, was asked by enslaved black people to come to court and to assist them as an interpreter during court cases. Um, the court cases do not mention what language uh, he used, but since he had lived in Brazil, and the most logical explanation here is that the language he used um, as an interpreter uh, was the Portuguese um, language. Um, now, these, these indications show us right, that, that Portuguese was indeed used, at least by some uh, enslaved people in, in Manhattan. Um, how do we explain this? Um, if we go back to our list, it's, I think, um, relatively easy to make the case that those who had lived in Latin America, lived in Spain, had lived in Portugal, um, were familiar with Iberian languages. And those in Cabo Verde and Saint Tomé um, uh, may have spoken uh, a Portuguese based Creole language and have developed uh, on the islands. Uh, we should also not forget that several of the black people in Manhattan had Iberian surnames like Albuquerque, Grande, Brito, um, and those surnames indicate that they may have been so called Ladinus. Uh, Ladinus is, is a 17th century term. Um, that was used for um, black people who had um, uh, assumed kind of a Portuguese and Iberian lifestyle. Uh, and many of these were um, also then uh, free. Um, we know that it was quite common in the 17th century that on Portuguese ships, there were black uh, seamen uh, working. Um, and uh, it is very well possible that um, some free black people who happened to be on a ship that was captured by the Dutch were then sold by the Dutch as slaves simply because they happened to be black. Um, we have an indication that this may have been the case um, from um, Northampton uh, in Virginia, um, where most of the enslaved actually had been bought um, from the Dutch in Manhattan. And among those was a man called Fernando, uh, and Fernando at one point takes his own case to court and he explains to the Dutch, uh, to the judge that he is uh, enslaved, but that he shouldn't be enslaved because he's a free man, he says, and he has proof, he has documents and, and he shows the judge in Northampton uh, his documents and, and then in, 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 in the sources, uh, it says, well, those documents were several papers in Portuguese or in Portugal Portuguese. Um, most likely, um, these papers in Portuguese were what we call in Portuguese cartas de alforia, um, so letters of manumission that he had with him and that proved that he was a free man. But in Northampton, nobody could read Portuguese. His case was dismissed and he had to live the rest of his life uh, as a slave. Um, but what about all the others, right? What about, what about all those who had roots in Central Africa? Angola, Congo, Luanga, uh, Luangu, did they also speak Portuguese? Um, that's a more difficult question to answer. 
uh, if we go back to our previous map, we know that uh, the Portuguese influence in the Congo region uh, was, was, was strong. Um, um, the religious influence, for instance, was strong. The Congo kingdom considered itself a Catholic kingdom and there was a strong Portuguese influence uh, in the region. Um, we also know that there was a strong influence of the Portuguese language uh, in, in the Congo region. We know that the elite learned Portuguese. We know that the Portuguese language was important for business. Um, we have Dutch sources um, proving that. And let me just give you one example, a letter from Peter van den Broeke, a Dutch businessman who went to Congo um, and then wrote um, that uh, the people in Congo, just like in Portugal, he says, they learn Portuguese and everyone goes the whole day with a book in the hand and with a rosary. Um, so there was definitely, you know, influence from the Portuguese language also in Central Africa. Yet the lingua franca in Central Africa, unlike in Saint Tome and in Cabo Verde, remained an African language. It remained Kikongo and Kimbundu. Um, and, and especially people outside of urban and coastal areas um, continued to speak only Kimbundu or Kikongo and not Portuguese. Uh, we see that clearly in letters from, from missionaries uh, who go to, to Congo and they try to do missionary work in Portuguese and then they realize so many people here don't understand us. Um, the example I wanna give is, is this Italian Capuchin uh, who says Portuguese in the Congo region is only understood by a few and even so in a rudimentary way for preaching education, it is important to use an interpreter who can speak Kikongo or, or Kimbundu. Yeah. Um, which then raises the question, could enslaved Africans from the Congo region also speak Portuguese when they arrived in Manhattan? We don't know. Uh, it is possible that some of them picked up some Portuguese, enough Portuguese to communicate while still living in Africa. Uh, we sh also should not forget that many had lived in Brazil and in Curaçao before they arrived in Manhattan. So it is well possible that either in Brazil they had learned some Portuguese or in Curaçao they had learned some Papiamento and that allowed them then to communicate somehow in a Portuguese-based Creole upon arrival uh, in Manhattan. Uh, let me conclude. Due to the paucity of sources, I think it is impossible to come to a conclusive answer with regard to the languages spoken by the black population in 17th century in Manhattan. There are, however, strong indications that in the early decades, and the lingua franca of the black population may well have been a creolized form of Portuguese, and that only over time, Dutch and later English imposed themselves as the lingua franca of the black population in Manhattan. This may actually have been the case, not just in Manhattan, but also in other parts of the Americas. And let me conclude by just uh, showing you one very interesting source from uh, South Carolina, where in the 18th century, there's a slave uprising. And then one person reporting on the slave uprising says the following, uh, read it for you. Um, he says that many of the people here in South Carolina are brought from the kingdom of Angola in Africa, and many of these speak Portuguese. Uh, and this is still in 1739, yeah, which is 100 years after the first mentioning of an Angolan person uh, in Manhattan. And still then, apparently many uh, were speaking uh, the Portuguese language. So it may well be that not just in Manhattan, but also in other parts of North America, at one point, the Portuguese language or a Portuguese pidgin was a language of importance for uh, the black population. So all of this, let me conclude, uh, shows the importance to look at the history of the Portuguese language in North America with different eyes. Yeah? Uh, we live today in a time of great concern about racial injustice uh, in this country. And I think when it comes to us teachers, professors, I, I think it's necessary to rethink the traditional way in which the history of Portugal and, and the Portuguese language has been taught. I think what we learned today is that uh, the earliest references to the use of the Portuguese language in North America come from black people, right? people with roots in Africa, people who were enslaved through Portuguese channels. Yet at the same time, 
these are also people who adopted elements of the Portuguese culture, elements that became part of their own identity. Uh, and that shows us also the complexity of the Portuguese presence in Africa. Uh, and also how important this presence is to American history. It is something I think that very few Americans are aware of, including very few African Americans. And it is in my view, one more reason to support the teaching and the study of the Portuguese language in this country, uh, including so at the beautiful California State University of Fresno, uh, that gave me this opportunity to present today my research uh, to all of you and for which I am very grateful. So I want to thank all of you and I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerome, Jerome Duol, for this fascinating uh, lecture and it certainly sheds new light uh, to the the experiences of black communities in, in, in the Americas and in, in the United States. Um, um, just a very quick comment about the, the term arriba, which was mentioned in one of your yeah. sources, because as you said, uh, indeed in Portugal, we don't hear it uh, as much as in, uh, mm -hmm. as in Spanish or in Spain, but I, I do, I, um, it is actually quite common in my family in Porto. Uh, it's, it's, it's considered a sort of an outdated kind of term. I don't really use it. It's, the older generations in my family also use it. And actually mm -hmm. within the same context in which it was used in your source, Interesting. is ill, either physically yeah. ill or psychologically weaker, let's say, yeah. We use that express expression can be used to sort of that's lift up someone. Yeah, that's so that was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to, if anyone has any more question, any questions and comments, they are more than welcome at this point. Mm -hmm. And Vinish, you could go ahead. There is one question. Did you see it from uh, the associate dean? Interim uh, associate dean says you La Porta. You see it there? Uh, mm -hmm. no. 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 Could you? <clears throat> It's on the Q&A, yes. and the, que the question was, what happened to the slaves who just arrived in Manhattan when the British invaded? Mm -hmm. um, very good question. Um, it's a fascinating story. Um, so it's a large uh, shipment that arrives in the Dutch colony. Um, the um, uh, directorship, Peter Stuyvesant, um, uh, starts preparation is to sell these people. Um, and then all of a sudden the English show up. Um, and and Stuyvesant um, then hands over the Dutch colony to the English. Um, and he knows of course that he's doing something tricky uh, because he decides not to fight. Um, and he later will have to justify himself. And in his justification, interestingly, he points to those enslaved people. And he says, you know, I, I couldn't uh, start a siege and, and, and then try to fight back uh, because we had to feed those people. And um, so, so interestingly, uh, he actually blames in a way uh, enslaved Africans for the Dutch surrender of Manhattan uh, to the English, um, uh, which is um, um, very, very problematic, of course, in, in a variety of ways, um, but at the same time, fascinating. And what happens to these people? Um, they are essentially then confiscated uh, by the English um, and the English um, sell them as enslaved people um, uh, in, 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 in um, the area of Manhattan. Some are taken to other English colonies, to Virginia, uh, Maryland, some end up in Maryland. Um, but um, yeah, essentially um, they, are, um, they are sold. Um, I don't have uh, any other questions that came through. Um, there are just some excellent comments, which is wonderful for through Facebook that people are enjoying it. Uh, we've had over 250 views so far. And so um, that's, that's great, but there's no specific questions from, uh, from, from Facebook, uh, Inish. Right, Sergio, I think he's asking a follow-up question. So the, do the English use them in New York? Can you, can you repeat that, Inish? I didn't hear the if, question. If the English use them in New York, uh, as, as a what do you mean with them? Uh, I don't know if Serge, you could clarify. Use the slaves, the slaves. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those, those people would then essentially um, start working for New York families or, or, or would, you know, be taken to, uh, to farms and, 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 and do the hard and dirty work 
uh, over there. Um, um, and, and that explains why still during the time that, um, 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 even after the time when, when the English um, conquered the Dutch colony, uh, rename uh, New Netherland into uh, New York, and still at that time, uh, you do find many references in the area to people with, with Portuguese names. Um, and, but uh, unfortunately, we don't find any references anymore to the Portuguese language. And the dominant language very quickly uh, becomes um, English. Um, but at the same time, some Dutch families remain, even though uh, the Dutch lost their colony. And uh, the English uh, allowed the Dutch settlers who wanted to stay. Um, and so many Dutch families remain in, in what has now become then uh, New York. Um, and they keep uh, there in slave, um, sometimes for several generations. Um, there's one very interesting case that maybe I can briefly mention. And by going back to the PowerPoint, uh, just for one second, uh, I could mention the case of a very famous person um, to the um, African American community uh, who has a connection to these earliest um, slave uh, population. Um, and that person, many of you may have heard of, and that person is Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth is a real icon of the African American oops, liberation uh, community. Um, and uh, Sojourner Truth uh, lived, as you can see here, in the late 18th century. Um, research revealed that her mother may actually be a descendant of these, of these uh, 17th century enslaved people who lived um, uh, in Manhattan. Um, and she herself uh, was born in 1797 in, in a small village in upstate New York where still at that time, uh, the dominant language was Dutch. And so her native language was not English, it was Dutch. Um, but what is interesting for us is that her mother also had completely kind of um, um, switched to the Dutch language, uh, spoke Dutch with, with her daughter. Um, but when, the, when, when she had to name her daughter, um, she decided to name her daughter Isabel, uh, which is clearly not a Dutch name. Uh, it's clearly a, a, a Portuguese name. Uh, and we find lots of Isabels in the 17th century uh, black community in, in Manhattan. And only later in life, uh, Isabel will change her own name into Sojourner Truth, but that's a whole different story. Um, but what is interesting is that um, in, in kind of name giving traditions, um, these, these very early uh, Afro-Portuguese elements uh, do show up. Um, but let me now go back. And to the main screen. We have another question. Yes. Um, could you please talk a little more about the concubine from Angola in Manhattan? Yeah, uh, also a fascinating story. Um, so um, um, this lady is, is brought uh, to Manhattan um, from Dutch Brazil. Um, we know that the last place in Dutch Brazil where this captain served was uh, San Luis and San Luis do Maranhão. Um, so most likely, uh, this black lady was from San Luis. Um, um, unfortunately, we don't know her name. Uh, all we know is that she was a black lady. Um, we know that they were in a relationship. Uh, we know that she was not enslaved. Um, and we also know, and this is fascinating, uh, we know that, that the Dutch captain was criticized uh, in the colony. Uh, for having a relationship with a black lady. Uh, other Dutch people did not like that at all, uh, but apparently he didn't care. Um, and he even had um, an offspring. He had a son uh, with this black Brazilian lady, um, a son called Jan, uh, Jan de Vries. Um, so a, a mulatto boy, right? mixed race. Um, and uh, what happens next is that the captain dies, uh, his wife, uh, his, his wife or concubine, uh, I don't think they were officially married, uh, also passes away or at least disappears in the sources. But then something very interesting happens. What happens is that the two enslaved people who came also with the captain uh, to the Dutch colony in Brazil, uh, a man and a woman, uh, Ilaria Criolo and, and Paulo Angola, 
um, they will um, contact the Dutch authorities and they will say, uh, poor child, he no longer has, has a, pa a father and, and a mother, um, can we take care of the child? Uh, and the Dutch authorities will, will allow them to do that. Um, so that's an amazing example of, of in a way, loyalty uh, from former slaves uh, to the child of their former master. Uh, and then they will educate um, and, uh, the little boy, uh, the Vries. Uh, and to make the story even more fascinating, is, is the following. And there was in the early 20th century um, an, an American linguist um, who was interested in um, black speech, what, what was called black speech at the time. So essentially what this person would do in the 1920s, uh, he would uh, go to rural areas in the New York, uh, in, in, in up, upstate New York, um, and he would look for black people uh, and he would ask them uh, to speak and he would record their language. Um, and he was fascinated by uh, a region in the state of New York called the Ramapo Mountains. The Ramapo Mountains. Um, it's, it's kind of an isolated uh, area in upstate New York. Um, and uh, when he was doing his research in, 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 in um, upstate uh, New York in the Ramapo Mountains, he stumbled upon um, um, black families who had um, Dutch surnames. Um, and one family he found uh, was the De Vries family. Uh, so black people with the name De Vries, which is the exact same name of that captain who had a son who was of mixed race. So we don't know for sure, but it may well be that, that these people, right, the De Vries people, are actually descendant of this uh, black captain who came from Brazil with his, with his black concubine and had a child and, and etc. So a fascinating, a fascinating story. Uh, we can't hear you. Interesting question. Yeah. Um, as a native New Yorker, I know that we still have a few Dutch words in New mm -hmm. English, but is there any evidence of Portuguese that you know of? Unfortunately not. Yeah, uh, the Portuguese, as I mentioned before, the Portuguese language uh, unfortunately disappeared, but as, as the person uh, said, and, and, and rightly so, um, there is uh, quite some Dutch uh, linguistic influence. Um, the reason why we Americans say cookies, and, and in England they say biscuits, has to do with the Dutch, because yeah? um, it, it's originally a Dutch term, cookie, um, but there's lots of other examples. Um, and perhaps the most famous one is, is Santa Claus, uh, Santa Claus being a Dutch term, uh, Sinterklaas, and um, that was then, you know, uh, became Americanized and became an American tradition, uh, but unfortunately not of Portuguese. Um, um, so um, when we speak about Portuguese influences in, uh, among, among um, black people in Manhattan, uh, we speak primarily about uh, the early generation, the first generation. Um, so people who lived there, um, you know, 1640, um, 1650, 1660, and, but then later generations, we see how um, um, Dutch and, and then later, of course, English impose themselves um, as, as their main language. One more question, please. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why not many Jews who left Recife uh, in 1654 did not go to Manhattan? Yeah, very good question, actually. Um, some did go, as I said before, um, um, but very few. Um, and um, um, the reason why not more of them came um, had to do primarily uh, with the politics of a person whose name was mentioned here in, in the presentation several times. And that person is Peter Stuyvesant. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant, um, who was at that point uh, the governor of um, the Dutch colony, um, he, and let me show you his picture, um, he was um, not only kind of the brain uh, behind this, this idea to develop uh, Manhattan into uh, a slave trading network, uh, but he was also extremely anti-Semitic. Um, so uh, what he will do is he will essentially do everything he can to pester away uh, Jews uh, from Manhattan uh, with success. Uh, most of them uh, will leave. 
Um, there is fascinatingly enough, uh, there's one of them uh, who refuses. Uh, and in spite of being pestered almost on a daily basis by Peter Stuyvesant, he decides to stay um, and uh, ultimately reaches out to the uh, Jewish community in Amsterdam and writes a letter to them and says, hey, uh, it's, it's terrible here in Manhattan. Uh, they're so anti-Semitic. They want all of us to go. They don't welcome us. Um, uh, but I want to stay. Uh, and he asks for help. Um, and some very influential members in the Jewish community in Amsterdam pressure then the Dutch West India Company uh, to write a letter to Stuyvesant and to tell him back off and uh, stop harassing Jews, uh, allow this person to stay. Uh, and then gradually the Jewish community starts to grow. But by then uh, the Dutch colony uh, is already um, uh, no longer a Dutch colony, it, it became English. Um, but but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the Jewish history uh, of Manhattan starts with the Dutch. Yeah? And, and it starts with people who had lived previously uh, in the Dutch colony in Brazil, and then from Brazil uh, ended up uh, in Manhattan. Uh, just uh, maybe one, one final word, uh, Ines, uh, since yes, I look yes. at this statue. Um, and this statue is actually uh, increasingly controversial. As you know, there's a debate going on in American society about statues, about statues relating um, to um, the dark past of, of the United States and, and connections with slavery are, are uh, part of this dark past, of course. Um, so I don't know uh, how long the statue of Mr. Stuyvesant will remain uh, in, in, in New York. It may, may well be that sooner or later this, this statue uh, will, will disappear. Uh, but that's just a, a brief uh, comment I wanted to make. So let me go back to the main screen. Just one, one last mm -hmm. comment that was made here that sure. you would like to comment as well, Dr. Mm -hmm. David Ross, our dear emeritus professor from Fresno State. He's saying mm -hmm. a few years ago, uh, in a, uh, he read in a recent uh, DNA, uh, in a study, uh, in a recent DNA study of the current population of Pernambuco in Brazil, that over 50% of the population had a Dutch marker. He's also noting that the synagogue in Recife uh, was, was recently reconstructed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it may well be. Uh, I would not be surprised. It's, it's, it's um, I'm not sure, Ines, if you've ever been to, to Recife in no, Pernambuco, but, but it's, it's oh, yeah. surprising. You, you find lots of people with blue eyes, for right. instance. Right? Yes, yes. And, and those are not Portuguese, right? Yes. These are <laughs> Dutch, yes. Dutch eyes, right? Um, and and what I find, uh, what, what, what surprised me the most, I would say, when I visited Pernambuco, is how this Dutch history of Brazil is perceived uh, very positively, actually, by today's Brazilians, mm -hmm. in the sense that if only the Dutch had stayed, uh, <laughs> then we would be much more prosperous. Uh, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the Portuguese kicked them out. And, and, and uh, I, I'm not sure if that's true, actually, because my answer to, to such comments is always look at Suriname, right? Uh, a Dutch colony and not necessarily in better shape uh, than Brazil. Uh, but it's something you, you quite often hear when, when you visit Brazil and, and, and mention the Dutch, the Dutch history. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for your fascinating lecture. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we all learned a lot and we will look at the uh, American experience, the Black American experience in, in the United States as, uh, in, in a totally different way. Uh, thank you uh, to all, the, all, all of you who were there in the audience with us and for your questions. And I believe we have the honor of having Dr. Honora Chap Chapman, our Dean, to give our final remarks. Thank you so much. She's on. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Inish and, and Dinesh, but especially thank you so much, Professor DeVille, for your amazing lecture. It was fascinating. It, it, it bridged the continents and taught us so much about the influence of not just Portuguese, but African and Dutch upon Manhattan and beyond and, and Brazil itself. So we are so grateful. And I would like to extend an invitation to you on Thank behalf you. of my colleagues that when we are done with this pandemic and we can gather again together in person, it would be delightful to have you down to Fresno to visit because I think that your, um, your lecture style and 
your ability to communicate these difficult ideas and to connect it with modern with modern times really does resonate with our students and it would be lovely to have you down here to it share be, that with it would be an honor it would be great I, it's just a drive it only takes about three hours <laughs> and it would be fantastic to have you come down you we so could get um africana studies and all sorts of colleagues across campus to join us thank you so much and so, thank you for attending i really appreciate that it, it was it was absolutely wonderful i learned a great deal and i do ancient jewish studies and yep. i now want to look more into yeah it's fascinating fascinating yeah i i've been to the synagogue in in uh, newport rhode island but now i've got to go check out other ones yes. that i've never seen before nice so yeah thank you thank you again Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean, for uh, accepting our invitation to jump in and uh, appreciate <laughs> that. She's she's always uh, she's she's always follows uh, a lot of the stuff that we do at PBBI and the Portuguese Studies Program, and we thank you for your support. Uh, thank you also to, of course, uh, all of the as Inish said, all of the attendees. Thanks to all of you who followed us uh, on uh, Facebook and for the nice comments. There were no questions, but there are tons of nice comments. Professor De Wolf is uh, indeed amazing, and thank you. Um, and of course, on behalf of PBBI, we will, as uh, Inish said it earlier, uh, once we go back to normality, whatever that is, and whenever that is, uh, we'd love to have you down, especially as we were chatting before the lecture. Uh, you showed some interest in knowing a little bit about the Portuguese American community in, in, in the valley, and so we'll uh, we'll take you around to some dairy or something like that, so we can give you <laughs> uh, in, indoctrinated into the Portuguese American experience in the Central Valley. Um, again, thank you, Inish, and thank you uh, to uh, the dean, and thank you to. Um, Everyone who was part of it, one more final thought uh, again uh, as a thank you to um, Flat for always uh, for being in the sponsor of uh, in the uh, PBBI uh, Flat uh, lecture series. Um, and uh, we just want to one little quick announcement. Uh, I couldn't miss the opportunity. We have some t attendees and we are still being followed by a few hundred people on Facebook. So you're going to forgive me, but I'm going to plug in. Uh, I'm going to be uh, not uh, not have any shame at all and plug in uh, our annual crowdfunding that PVBI is doing. Um, it is a, a, it's an annual event. And this year it's to raise some funds for a, a project with our hub from the linguistics department. And so if you haven't donated, you can. Uh, $20 is all we ask. We Our goal is to have 150 donors. We're at 100 11 as of about an hour ago so uh we're just we're less than 40 away uh and we have until the end of uh, october and right now we are at a little over ten thousand four hundred dollars um so thank you all and please do uh, it's just very simple by the way it's just going to uh google and putting fresno state crowdfunding and it'll take you to all the different uh, crowdfunding projects where you want to make sure you go down where there's uh, some portuguese uh, 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 a couple of pictures that you identify with um and the portuguese beyond borders institute our next lecture uh is a panel actually i'd like to let you know about that that's coming up on the 28th october 28th and I'd like to also thank Fresno State Alumni Association for promoting this lecture and for, uh, for uh, working with us and now promoting all of the lectures that we put forth uh, at Fresno State through PBBI and of course, uh, joint ventures uh, with uh, MCLL and PSP. And so um, thanks to the Fresno State Alumni Association, it's another way to get out to a lot of folks uh, in, uh, in the community uh, and throughout the states. Uh, so the lecture will be on the 28th, which is on a Wednesday next week at 6 p.m. It's called Conversations of the 21st Century, Sexism in the California Portuguese American Community. We have a panel of seven fascinating women from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco, uh, including the Valley uh, from different perspectives that will be talking about their experience, different generations. Uh, so seasoned folks like myself and some younger folks like Inish and so, uh, and all those in between. And so we will, it'll be a fascinating conversation of their experiences in the Portuguese American community uh, as this is in collaboration with the California Portuguese American uh, Coalition. So do tune in that next uh, uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, the 28th at six o'clock. And we have a bunch of things in November that we'll announce at a later time. Again, Inês, thank you so much. Jerome, thank you so much. And of course, Dean Chapman, thanks. And thanks to all of those who participated with some great questions. Take care, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, we'll see you next time. And uh, thank you for allowing us, Jerome, for uh, this fascinating talk and also for allowing us to share on social media and record it for uh, future students to take a look at it. Okay.
Appreciate it, all of you. Thank you so much. Good night to all of you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.